I'm Julian Gordon. I'm the Vice President Asia Pacific for the Hyperledger Foundation, and I'm delighted to be here for the Hyperledger member in-depth webinar with our wonderful member, GSBN, on their next generation blockchain consortium, combining enterprise blockchain with confidential computing. Before we dive into today's presentation, some quick uh, housekeeping items. As this is a Linux Foundation meeting, I need to mention that participants must comply with our antitrust policy, which you can access and see on our website. Also, as we go along, please free, feel free to ask questions in the Q&A button below. Uh, we'll have Q&A after the presentation. Hyperledge Executive Director Daniela Barbosa was hoping to join us, but she's at the World Economic Forum in Davos and has been pulled into meetings. So Daniela has prepared some thoughts for us, which I'm going to share with everyone now. Greetings from Davos, Switzerland, where this week the World Economic Forum is having their annual event where one of the themes is cooperation in a fragmented world. Removing trade barriers and empowering businesses to trade more easily by cutting red tape and emphasizing digitalization is one of the WEF's key te themes, and I'm looking forward to engaging with global leaders on this topic while I'm here in Davos. My name is Daniela Barbosa, and I'm the Executive Director of the Hyperledger Foundation. Our own Hyperledger community has been working on trade finance blockchain-based solutions for over seven years, with many lessons learned and earned. Many of these lessons, both on the business and technical side, are being applied to exciting new production implementations of trade networks that you will learn today during this webinar. These next-generation networks combine blockchain technology with other emerging technologies such as confidential computing and leverage state-of-the-art advancements in these disciplines. Across the Linux Foundation, digital trust projects like the Hyperledger Foundation, which is focused on blockchain and blockchain-related projects, and the Confidential Computing Foundation, which is fo focused on trusted execution environments, technologies, and standards, are helping these next generation of trade consortiums. Today, you will hear from two of our Linux Foundation projects, the Hyperledger Foundation and the Confidential Computing Foundation, as well as from one of these newer platforms brought to market by Global Shipping Business Network, or GSBN, to facilitate data exchange while maintaining the integrity, privacy, security, and auditability of the data, a critical path to enable cooperation in this fragmented world. I want to thank GSPN's CTO, Edmund Toe, for GSPN's support of the Hyperledger Foundation and for joining Hart Montgomery, our Hyperledger CTO, and Dan Middleton, Principal Engineer for Confidential Computing at Intel, who will be speaking on today's webinar. I hope you enjoy the webinar, and I look forward to discussing this and other topics with you in the future. <clears throat> Julian, mute. And so thank you, uh, Daniela, for that uh, that great uh, presentation from uh, from Davos. Uh, so I'm going to go out with much further ado, straight into the presentations. Uh, so first, I'm going to hand it over to our, our wonderful CTO at the Hyperledger Foundation, Hart. So Hart, can you take it from here, please? Certainly. Uh, thanks a lot, Julian. Uh, can you hear me? We can hear you. Great. So... Uh, hi, every, are my slides visible? Yes. Wonderful. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Hart, and today I'm going to be briefly introducing the Hyperledger Foundation. Uh, as Julian and Daniela alluded, I am the Hyperledger Foundation CTO, uh, and my background is in blockchain and cryptography research. So before I really get into the Hyperledger Foundation, I want to mention some general background about the Linux Foundation, which as everyone alluded earlier, uh, contains both the Confidential Computing Consortium and Hyperledger. So the Linux Foundation's goal is to help and shepherd open development uh, across all of software. And one of 
my favorite things about the Linux Foundation is that it is present in a lot of different areas and has a ton of different projects, uh, many of which, you know, most people don't probably realize. Um, so things like, you know, Kubernetes, uh, LF Energy, LF Edge, uh, automotive grade Linux, all of these things are actually Linux Foundation projects. And most people associate the Linux Foundation with just the Linux kernel. Uh, but there are probably several other software projects that you use every day in the Linux Foundation without even realizing it. Um, and just some numbers here. It's an astronomical uh, effort with a huge amount of developers and projects. It's a crucial part of modern technology and open source software. So what is the Hyperledger Foundation and where does it sit in all of this? Well, we like to think of it as a global cross-industry consortium of communities collaborating and advancing uh, blockchain technology and distributed ledger technology. So what makes it special? Uh, well, Hyperledger is an open source, not-for-profit, uh, accelerating blockchain. But why do people like Hyperledger? Why do people use Hyperledger? Uh, it's hosted by the LF, as I've implied. Uh, it's neutral and collaborative, so it's open to anyone who wants to participate. Uh, you know, it's immune to the commercial interests of any single company, uh, and it's industry standard blockchains uh, by business uh, with an enterprise focus. So some background. Uh, the Hyperledger Foundation builds blockchain software, not blockchains. So we provide a community for open development around blockchain. We do not run blockchains as part of Hyperledger. We don't run tokens or anything like that. Uh, and, you know, actual blockchains implementations are, are out of scope of the Hyperledger Foundation. Um, we have a global team of developers uh, and we're always transparent as possible. There's no pay to play for technical participation in Hyperledger. And here are just some numbers on Hyperledger. Uh, as you can see, uh, these are from last year. I don't have the up-to-date numbers for this year, but we have quite a few contributions and quite a few companies contributing uh, to Hyperledger. Uh, another slide on, briefly on momentum. I don't think I need to go through everything here, uh, but you can take a quick glance to see how, you know, how many people are involved in the broader Hyperledger community. So one thing I want to mention uh, and, and go over today is what's the core of blockchain? Well, uh, the core of blockchain is decentralized trust. And, you know, Edmund is, I'm sure will certainly get into this uh, in his portion of the talk later today. Um, but we can think of a database or blockchain as a store of records. And the fundamental question is who gets to decide what records belong in the database? If one person or one entity decides it's centralized and there's sort of many different people or companies or whoever decides, then it's decentralized. And this is sort of a continuum, not, you know, a simple yes or no. Uh, and for the technical people in the audience, uh, the consensus algorithm is probably the most impactful design choice. Um, and if you look at blockchains, right, you know, you can sort of go from, you know, the most decentralized to the least decentralized on a continuum, but as you become more decentralized, you pay a price for performance. And that's why things like, you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum, um, you know, at least if you use the L1s today are not scalable enough for many business applications. So why do we care about decentralized trust? Uh, well, suppose we have several entities that need to agree on some data but no one trusts any other single entity to be the source of truth or a store of information needs to, to be made redundant in the case of compromise or attack by a hacker. Um, or what if the entity that would be the best official you know, source of truth for some data doesn't want to or cannot be responsible for the upkeep of the data or people responsible for maintaining a data set are dynamic and changing quickly. So, one thing to think about, and I think is a critical point about blockchain, uh, is, you know, if you're asking, do I need a distributed ledger or a blockchain, it's really just, do I need a database with decentralized trust? And when you're talking about an application like GSBN, you know, this is where it's, it's really important to have decentralized trust. 
Uh, and this is why blockchain is such a great solution for this kind of problem. So, uh, you know, today we sort of conflate blockchain and distributed ledger as terms. And so I want to make sure that everyone's clear on this. So technically speaking, a blockchain is an append only system of record uh, and a distributed ledger is a distributed database with decentralized trust. These terms are mostly used interchangeably. Um, and if we think about popular blockchain systems, right, you know, you can sort of think of Bitcoin as a distributed database uh, for some some sort of money with decentralized trust and Ethereum could be uh, a distributed database with, you know, decentralized trust for computer programs, which, you know, a smart contract is really just a computer program. Uh, and Fabric, for instance, uh, you know, at least in theory, has slightly more centralized trust than Ethereum, but it's still quite decentralized and it has much, much more performance. So, you know, this is sort of what you want to remember uh, when you're thinking about, do I need a, a blockchain? Uh, you want to think about, you know, what's the information being stored and why is having one centralized entity maintain this information a bad idea or generally infeasible? And as you're thinking about, you know, applications uh, like the GSBN, you know, this is really good to consider. And, and you can see why blockchain is really useful and is uh, being used in business and why it's just not sort of a hype technology. Um, and, you know, people ask, well, where can we use this decentralized trust? And it's really all over the place. Um, you know, I've just listed some of the applications that are here uh, that we see people use Hyperledger technology for. And, you know, um, it's, it's not, you know, it's not small companies. We have lots of big companies and, and big enterprises, you know, realizing that they need decentralized trust and Hyperledger technologies are the way to achieve this. Um, so here's sort of the, uh, the technologies used by the top 100 institutions. Uh, Fabric is popular. We note that for Ethereum, uh, a lot of people in this list are actually using Hyperledger Besu. Um, and there are other technologies as well. So uh, just briefly going over some of the most popular applications for blockchain. Uh, so payments and trade finance is one of our biggest application areas. And obviously the GSBN is a great example of this. Um, so, you know, <laughs> I'll defer this to uh, later in this presentation um, because you're going to hear a lot about this today. Um, CBDCs and finance. Here's a, uh, a diagram of where people are currently experimenting with Hyperledger technologies for CBDCs, and you can see it's really all over the place. Uh, I'll point out that we have uh, a whole ebook on CBDCs and finance if you're interested in this application as well. Um, uh, and provenance is supply chain, uh, also another application where decentralized trust and hyperledger are extremely useful um, so things companies like circular walmart tencent uh, track and trace is very important uh, and it is a, a big application of blockchain uh, and finally digital identity um, i don't know how many people here are, are familiar with digital identity or the core concepts uh, but self-sovereign identity is is an extremely uh, powerful technology uh, and, uh, you know, identity is going to underpin pretty much everything in Web3. Um, so we're excited to see that take off. Uh, so, you know, all of these applications are really driving, you know, a ton of new development priorities. And, you know, now in today's Hyperledger, we're really seeing an effort to address modularity, uh, interoperability, privacy, performance, um, so really things that, you know, involve working together in a global network of communities, of blockchains, of people, and really focusing on this, you know, sort of world of many networks. Um, so to, to address this, you know, we have a bunch of uh, 14 currently different Hyperledger projects, and I'll explain some of them briefly. 
Uh, we obviously have some core distributed ledgers, and these tend to be our older projects. Uh, many of you are familiar with Fabric or Besu, but we also have Indy, uh, Aroha, and Sawtooth, and which Dan was a founding contributor of Sawtooth actually uh, back in the day. Um, and we also have some tools, and these really start to address our interoperability and, and modularity and the new focus uh, that we're seeing on this sort of world of many networks. And uh, Bevel is a tool for blockchain uh, automation. Uh, so it, it's designed to help you run blockchains more easily. Cactus, uh, now recently renamed Cacti, uh, is a tool that enables blockchain interoperability and integration. And Firefly, I like to think of as sort of a blockchain container, which means that you can write code once and you can run it on uh, a lot of different blockchains that Firefly supports. Um, and finally, we have some libraries. Uh, for instance, Ares is an extremely popular library uh, focused on identity. Um, so, you know, that's about all that I have time for uh, in today's presentation. Um, so I believe we're taking questions at the end. Uh, so thank you all for your time. Uh, and I will be happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, and if you don't get a chance to ask today, uh, happy to answer questions online via email or Discord or however you can contact me. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Hart. That's great. And uh, please, everyone, there is a Q&A button. So please put questions there and we will be answering those as we go along. I'm now going to hand over to Dan, um, uh, who, as uh, was suggested, has a long history also with Hyperledger, uh, but is the a principal engineer with the Confidential Computing Consortium. So I'm now going to hand it over to you, Dan. Thanks, Julian. Are you able to see my slides OK? We can see them and we can hear you. Wonderful. All right. Well, thanks again for the uh, invitation to be here. Uh, as you've mentioned, I uh, have some time with the Hyperledger going back to its inception uh, and really enjoyed uh, learning a lot about open source through through my participation in Hyperledger. And I think it's a great way for any of you out there to get uh, deeper in technology and, and broader in the ecosystem. I now spend most of my time focused on the Confidential Computing Consortium, where I, I have a similar role uh, recently chairing the, the Technical Advisory Council there. Um, the, <clears throat> the, uh, the CCC, we, we start our meetings a lot like the Hyperledger uh, Foundation does, which is we point out that we are an open collaborative community and everybody is welcome, all are welcome to come and participate with us in any of the, the public venues that, that we have for the CCC. Uh, we like mentioning that even before we mention what it is we do. Uh, so we're a little younger than Hyperledger. Uh, we were officially announced in the end of 2019. So pragmatically, we really started off in 2020. Uh, and the goal of that was to accelerate the adoption of this thing that we've been talking about, confidential computing. So we should probably talk about what that is. Normally, if you have some secret information and you want to protect that when you have that data at rest, like when you've written it to disk, you probably use something like disk encryption. If you're going to go send it to another computer, you're going to use a protected mode of communication, maybe something like TLS. But until the last few years, there hasn't been a real practical or scalable way to actually protect those secrets when you go to use them. So when you're actually working with the secret information, that's when it's sort of most vulnerable and it is exposed to any malware that might be on that host that you're working in. And so these confidential computing technologies are a way to actually protect that uh, so you don't expose that even during the execution. We, we worked uh, towards a very precise one sentence definition of what this should entail. And so the focuses that you see there are that it is protecting the data while it's in use. It's not just software mechanisms. You know, it will include some software mechanisms, but it's got to be hardware-based because that adds another layer of security to uh, how you protect the information. And then very recently, we, we felt that we needed to add the word attested into that definition. And if you have not been um, exposed to attestation before, this is the mechanism of providing evidence 
so you know that you can trust that that platform is actually protecting the data that you're going to send it. So you can learn more about that definition uh, through a lot of the materials that we make available on our website. We've got three different interest levels or interest perspectives that are covered by white papers that we've already generated. So if you've really come into this more from a business perspective and you wanna know like, is there actually a big enough market of this kind of technology that it's safe for me to build on it? Uh, we have third-party market research, which is the, the top paper that you see there. If you really wanna dig more into the technical details of what do we mean by a trusted execution environment? Um, yeah. Technical analysis. And, uh, I think you're still showing the first slide. Oh, that is unfortunate. Let me uh, stop sharing and reshare. Let me know uh, if it has refreshed for you. I think that's a refresh. Do you want to try go going forward a slide? Okay. Is it working? No. Okay, so I'm gonna take it out of uh, slideshow mode. And we will just... Uh, Try sharing again here. If that doesn't work, we can show the slides for you. Oh, you are now. You're on slide four, five. We can see it. Great. Yes. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. All right. So we'll pick up where we left off there. There's there's three different articles that we've three different white papers that we've created, um, and you can get to all of those through the website. Since you're here today, I don't want to talk exclusively about stuff that's already out there. So we've got a couple of things that, that are not announced that we will get into. Um, we're laid out a lot like Hyperledger. And if you don't know how Hyperledger is laid out as an open source organization, that's not a problem. But it all sort of starts with the, the member companies. Uh, when we started in 2020, you'll note that there's a lot of big name tech companies that were already deep into the technology and uh, all wanted to work together to promote uh, the adoption of, of this new mechanism for security. As we headed into 2021, we started seeing, getting, seeing more adopters get engaged. Uh, I like Eric's article here because he talks about it from the perspective both of being an adopter of the technology and also as a technology provider. Uh, and I thought that was a nice intersection of the growth that we saw heading into 2021 um, with more and more uh, companies participating. As we exited 2022, um, probably the, the most growth that you see there is that general members area kind of got denser because we've got about a third more members there. And to me, that reflects the amount of innovation that's available at the software level. So a lot of what we do with confidential computing are fundamental building blocks that are at the hardware. Um, but whenever we add some new building block at the hardware, that really creates like a combinatoric effect that uh, the software that you can build with that is, is really um, much more prolific. So much like Hyperledger, uh, what we try to do is facilitate the development of technology, development of papers uh, to make it easier for uh, end users to adopt. And we accomplished quite a bit over the last year. Uh, one of the things that is not officially out yet, but we already have drafted is, is this sort of year in review for 2022. Uh, so that is not out on the website today, but I'm guessing within the next couple of weeks, you will see uh, an article out there that covers all of these points. I'm just gonna point out a couple things. One is the importance, again, of adding attestation to our definition. Uh, and we, we did some increased work in a special interest group that I'll talk about in a couple slides. And because 
<clears throat> this information is new to a lot of folks. Uh, all of our technical committee, uh, our technical council meetings, uh, we try to include uh, tech talk and we include uh, organizations from outside confidential computing that, that are adjacent to us as well. So multi-party computing, homomorphic encryption, these are all topics that, that we'll cover in the meeting. So they are, uh, I think, educational, regardless of what level you're at with the technology. And then the last thing is we, we had Hyperledger's own Tracy Kurt, uh, chair of your uh, technical committee, uh, come talk to us about uh, developing communities uh, because once again, diversity, stability, and inclusion is, is important to us at, at the CCC as well. So one other uh, unannounced thing that you get to learn about today is, is the, the latest white paper that we will be posting on our website is about terminology. As you go to deploy confidential computing, you know that can take the form of a library, it can take the form of an application, a container, an entire virtual machine. And being precise about security is important so that you are uh, applying it in a way that actually gives you the protections that you're looking for. So we have a fairly detailed diagram here that, that shows a lot of the different ways that you could embody confidential computing along with uh, textual descriptions that help inform your selection or how you choose to go about deploying that software. Uh, the document itself is not officially published. That will probably be up within a week or two. But because we are an open source organization, all of this is developed in the public. And if you go out to our GitHub at the URL that I have at the bottom of the slide, you can actually read that document today uh, in its markdown form rendered on GitHub. So we would not be here, of course, without uh, open source software. So we've got uh, seven projects right now at the CCC. Uh, and these come primarily from a lot of those original technology companies that uh, saw value in confidential computing, but then also a, a few new entrants and a, and a spin out from one of those companies. <clears throat> There's a lot of different ways that you can adopt this. If you wanna be as precise as possible, with how you are building the security envelope around your software or your secrets, uh, you can work down at the API level. And that's what you get with the Open Enclave SDK. Most of the other projects here are about taking it up a level of abstraction. If you have a pre existing application and you want to containerize it, Gramming and Oaklum have ways to uh, build a containerized version that will launch that container in a trusted execution environment. Uh, and if your interest is more in WebAssembly, uh, NARCS is a very interesting project uh, that spun out from uh, our friends at Red Hat. Uh, Verizon is the newest project in the CCC, and that provides building blocks to work with attestation. And attestation is such an important topic that it has its own special interest group for us. Uh, we also have a special interest group for the operational considerations of confidential computing. You might have uh, compliance obligations uh, that come from regulatory frameworks. Uh, and we have, you know, particularly in, for those of you that are joining us from a, like a, a financial services perspective, uh, participation in this SIG might be val really valuable to you. Because I've mentioned attestation at least three times now, uh, without giving you a really solid description of it, other than that's the evidence that you use when you engage, usually in a protocol, so that you understand whether you can safely interact with uh, that confidential computing environment. I wanted to point out that we have a ton of content. <clears throat> if you go to our SIGS GitHub, uh, that's uh, listed there at the top of the slide, uh, you will find a meetings repository that has recordings of talks on uh, various standards like DICE, uh, uh, protocol proposals like attested TLS, uh, and uh, at least three of the projects that, that I had listed on a previous slide use something called remote attestation TLS. So this is a way to build directly into your TLS connection uh, verification of 
uh, evidence that the environment that you're running with has integrity. Uh, and because those all came from the same paper, but not from a standard, they, they took slight variations in how they were implemented. And a great outcome of this SIG was recognizing that there were just little differences and we could harmonize those. So our, uh, our newest addition to the attestation SIG is a sub-project to harmonize these uh, remote attestation TLS projects. The, the other SIG that I mentioned uh, is about managing risk and compliance. One of the kinds of things that we're going to start doing in that SIG is reaching out to these different uh, organizations that you see listed on this slide, those and others, uh, and start to build in a recognition for the capabilities of confidential computing. And finally, uh, we'll talk just real briefly here about what we do with outreach. One of the benefits of working together in open source in a consortium like this is that uh, we, you know, the 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 sum is uh, greater than uh, the individual parts, and so we we get together in a variety of ways with outreach, whether it's webinars like the one that we're on here through Hyperledger uh, or directly at conferences, and we have a pretty full conference schedule lined up for 2023. Uh, we get underway at FOSDEM in a few weeks. And then in March, one of our biggest online presences is at uh, OC3. So if you want to take a look for OC3 in March, that's probably a very convenient way for most of you to learn uh, the next level of the, the state of the art in confidential computing. And then in June, for the first time, <clears throat> we have an in-person conference in San Francisco. So you'll start seeing more online for the Confidential Computing Summit uh, in San Francisco. And that brings us to uh, the end of uh, the material for Confidential Computing. Thank you, Dan. That was great. Uh, yeah. And I'd like to reiterate what he said at the beginning. Uh, everyone is welcome. And diversity is important. It's kind of our strength here at Hyperledger. So I just want to reinforce that. And, and thank you, Dan. That was great. And now I'm going to hand over to Edmund. Uh, from GSBN, the CTO of GSBN, who's going to go through, who made this all possible today, who's going to go through the, the Global Shipping Business Network. Thank Edmund. you, Julian. And I trust you can uh, see my uh, screen and also uh, hear me okay. Um, so thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, my name is Edmund, I'm the Chief Technology Officer of uh, Global Shipping Business Network. Uh, before we, uh, we go through today's agenda, I just want to uh, you know, say thank you once again for the support uh, from Hyperledger and also a Confidential Computing Consortium. So let's get started. So uh, this is our agenda today. So first, uh, we want to um, share a little bit about the background of GSBN. Um, next, we want to go into the um, technology platform of GSBN. Um, then we look into a number of use cases um, starting from the first one around cargo release, which is you know a process in the supply chain, uh, followed by uh, the electronic bill of lading solutions, uh, which is often the the connection point between the two industry, the supply chain industry and the uh, and the financial industry, you know, the trade finance, because EBL is a uh, is is a product which is you know related to also the um, the letter of credit financing. Um, and then to move on to share some of the other activities that we are doing uh, related to the trade finance uh, space, including you know, um, um, how uh, products on open account financing, as well as uh, shipping activity insights, um, particular this one leveraging um, confidential computing um, as, a, as a technology complementing with blockchain. Uh, we'll have a demo um, at the end um, and let's get started. So about GSBN. So GSBN, um, we, uh, set up as an a independent entity in March uh, 2021, which giving us roughly around two years of uh, operating history. Uh, but actually the project date back back in uh, uh, 2019. So uh, when it first started, um, some of the uh, uh, founding members, which we see on the, on the right hand side, as well as our, our shareholders, uh, back in 2019, we uh, signed the uh, service agreement for um, the resources commitment to obtain um, the necessary approval uh, related to regulatory, you know, competition and, 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 and I trust for the establishment of Global Shipping Business Network. If we are describing um, some of the founding members and shareholders on the right, uh, we have three shipping lines. 
we have the shipping line from Germany, so Hepaloy. Uh, we have the shipping line from uh, uh, China, Costco Shipping, uh, the shipping line that originated from Hong Kong, OOCL. We have five of the global terminal operators. So uh, Hedgeson Port, um, headquartered in Hong Kong, um, the port uh, group in Singapore, so PSA, um, as well as the uh, largest port in the world in terms of food food, um, the, uh, the port in Shanghai, um, SIPG group, um, uh, as well as the uh, Costco shipping port and, um, and the, the uh, Qingdao port. So with all these um, eight company, what, what does that mean? That actually account for over one third of global container volumes. So it's very exciting, you know, from the beginning that, um, you know, we have this, this strong backing from the industry. Um, if we are looking into emerging technology like blockchain and confidential computing, what are some of these use cases that we can build on top? What can we bring to the industry? So to share some of the highlight of GSBN. So uh, we are a trade data utility platform, and we are also set up as a not-for-profit organization. Um, I want to unpack a little bit, you know, why, why we have such decisions. Uh, we believe um, in order to bring um, changes to the industry, um, data is very important. Um, and it is uh, um, as important as uh, like water, like electricity, which are, which are utility, which in many places in the world, the organization that are providing those uh, uh, you know, utility, um, their goal is not to maximize profit but to you know, provide, the, provide this as a utility to the society. Um, we are a, a data platform and also open to you know, cross uh, industry uh, participations. Um, on the technology front, uh, we are powered by blockchain technology, um, in particular using um, Hyperledger Fabric, uh, which is built on trusted you know, permission technology. One of the very interesting design uh, of GSBN is that GSBN, we do not have access of your data. Uh, which is you know very important to build uh, to build to build uh, the data exchange platform where we have you know uh, different parties and it's on some occasion they could be competitive with each other's um, and for GSBN for us uh, we don't have even even for myself as a CTO we don't have access to those data um, as an independent not for profit consortium uh, we are here to choose fit for purpose technology so currently we are building on a number of um, um, you know, infrastructure, including uh, uh, Oracle, Microsoft, um, Alicao in China. Uh, while we can talk a lot about technology, uh, we are also very use case driven. So in today, we'll share more on some of these use cases and what are the impact that we can make uh, to the industry. So we will move on to a quick uh, summary of the uh, technology platform of GSBN. So um, the mission of GSBN is to facilitate data exchange uh, while maintaining the uh, integrity, privacy, and the security and the auditability of the data. And if we are going to break it down, we break it down into the, uh, these three layers. So the first one, starting with a number of products and services, which we'll go through that in the use case sections. In the bottom, we have a number of platform capability. At the bottom, we have the, um, the foundational technology. So we, we talk about blockchain um, at GSBN. Um, you know, we are using um, Hyperledger Fabric uh, in, in productions. Um, and, and currently we are not uh, uh, you know, putting sensitive data on, on, on the blockchain and mainly use, uh, putting hashes of those transactions. Um, so you know, allowing uh, different parties to verify the authenticity of those transactions. And we also have uh, nodes deployed in uh, multiple jurisdictions. So we have uh, some blockchain nodes deployed uh, you know, in, in, within China or you know, outside China in other locations. Um, second point that we want to highlight is on encryptions. So uh, the way the encryption is designed at GSBN is um, the data is actually encrypted before sending to a GSBN platform. So, um, <clears throat> so at GSBN, we don't, uh, we don't have access to those data. And this is a technical uh, reason why um, you know, we see you know, different parties, you know, shipping line and terminals uh, on how they can trust us. On top of these two um, um, foundational technology, we believe and we see confidential computing is also a very um, um, appropriate uh, and uncomplimenting technology on blockchain. So that as a result, we can ensure data is tamper-proof, um, is only shared with uh, permission parties uh, throughout the data life cycle, meaning you know, at rest, in transit, and also in use. Uh, and based on that, we have developed a number of um, platform capability on top, starting from the, the workflow APIs, 
uh, which we'll share a little bit more, particular some of these related use cases or you know, cargo release or electronic bill of lading uh, consents collections, uh, which is a pretty important element in the uh, in the in the data uh, uh, sharing, uh, particular around you know the open account uh, use cases uh, on the trade finance part, um, identity management, as well as you know data key room related to you know confidential computing, which we'll uh, have a quick demo on the uh, shipping activity insight. So with that, um, yeah, let's go to the, the, the use cases. So the first use cases uh, which we want to share is on, on cargo release. Now, what, what, what does that mean? So um, um, typically when uh, a cargo and container cargo, it, it is at a destination port, um, to release a cargo uh, uh, traditionally, uh, it takes a, a, a good number of days and usually involve a lot of you know, uh, paper documents. Um, uh, and, and we see uh, it's a scenario where they involve uh, multiple parties, and this party could be, you know, shipping lines, um, terminals, uh, ship agents, etc. Where we see there are multiple parties, which they need to agree on this on a single source of truth, and this, this single source of truth, um, you know, is the status of the container. This is a perfect, uh, you know, use cases for technology like blockchain. So, um, so in in our products, you know, we have with our blockchain solutions, we have, you know, digitizing the process. Um, process between um, exchange of document, you know, um, um, shipping documents such as CA bill, tariffs release, delivery order, etc. Um, and with our blockchain solutions, we are very pleased to see we have shortened the process that uh, that usually take you know two to three days to to one to two hours. So since our launch, uh, we have rolled out to uh, four um, different regions over sixteen ports. So here we give a snapshot of our solutions that roll out globally. Um, you know, uh, you know, strong footprint in Asia, in China, uh, um, Singapore, Thailand, uh, Rotterdam, which is a very you know important port uh, in Europe, um, and rolling out to you know Latin America such as Mexico. So um, our second use case is on um, um, electronic bill of uh, lighting solutions. Um, to set the context, a uh, uh, bill of lighting is uh, is a very important trade documents. So this is issued by the carriers to acknowledge the receipt of the cargo from the shipper. Uh, and by using blockchain technology, the title owner and the document holder can both be recorded and, and logged on the blockchain. Um, assigned on the logistic front, um, this is a document which is also important in the, in the trade finance process. And in many of the letter of credit transactions, uh, which, is, uh, 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 which is heavily used in bank, um, uh, original bill of lading is also required. So uh, this is a, a, a product that is you know, not by uh, building by GSBN, it's actually building by um, you know, a, a company called, called IQX. Now, what that means is um, at, at GSBN, uh, we, are, we are very open to, to cooperate. Um, so if you have you know, future use cases, if there's any, any, any idea, um, um, speak to us. You know, we, want to, we want to explore in the community. Um, and since the launch of IQX CBL, um, you know, we are very pleased to see uh, interest from banks um, and a number of uh, um, um, blockchain consortium as well. So um, below, we are sharing some snapshots of the launch of the EBL uh, event uh, with Bank of China, um, our partnerships with another blockchain consortium, Contour. Uh, and on the right-hand side, we're also sharing a lot of uh, uh, some of the things that we are also um, uh, working on, um, particular, you know, uh, expanding Rather than just container shipping, we're moving into bulk shipping. You know, working with Pimco, uh, as well as uh, working with uh, uh, Digital uh, Container Shipping Association (DCSA) and a number of other uh, uh, EBL solutions provider on the topic of interoperability. So, uh, from the trade finance side, we briefly touch on the uh, the the letter of credit. Uh, um, but from bank side, um, um, they are. Uh, um, there are also, um, there's a very popular financing around open account. And what we see is you know, shipping data is also essential for banks to validate the genuineness of uh, shipment in trade finance approval and, and cross-border payment process. And for many years, you know, banks have been just you know, relying on a paper-based um, you know, BL because they have no means to verify uh, those data. And hence at GSBN, we have developed um, the consensus application, which established a channel to facilitate consensus-based um, secure data transfer between carrier and banks. We quickly walk you through the workflow. So, you know, starting from the below, banks can you know, make such requests uh, via GSBN, um, and that will notify the beneficiary cargo owner to provide a consensus. They will send it to the carrier, um, carrier will review it, um, and then they can share the data and uh, for the banks to view it. 
So uh, um, this is this is uh, making this app is make the whole data sharing possible. And on the on the on the right, we are also sharing some of the you know successful pilot transaction with Hapaloy and Bank of China on this initiative. Um, and going into uh, um, the last use case, on top of you know validating the generous of the transaction, we see bank um, also need to conduct a, a credit assessment um, as well as you know KYC in the facility uh, uh, setup stage. And we see shipping data when they're aggregated, it adds a lot of value um, by providing uh, insight to companies' activities. Uh, um, so we combine you know, blockchain um, as, as a data exchange to um, you know, confidential. We have you know, securely uh, processed those data where you know, carriers do not need to discover more than necessary. And banks also have a way to actually digest those data. Um, so, a quick illustration of how that fit into the pictures. Um, you can imagine there's a set of you know, shipping data that sit within the ERP system of the shipping lines. Uh, we're sent to the blockchain, you know, allowing you know, those to be you know, exchanged it and also um, you know, have a tamper-proof uh, record, um, combining uh, with you know, uh, encryptions and also how, uh, how that um, um, being, being uh, analyzed in the data key room and we can get, uh, we can get an aggregated insight. So by combining you know, blockchain and confidential computing technologies, uh, we can guarantee data lifecycle with you know, privacy control, uh, security and audibility. So uh, we actually will look into a quick example of, of this um, uh, um, use cases. So, um, so uh, to, to, to share exactly what we are going to demo. So here, um, as we mentioned, when bank is structuring a trade, um, they would like to have holistic view of you know, customers, you know, business model, profitability, and track record. Uh, instead of looking at shipment one by one, uh, where banks needs to uh, um, banks can have now a statistic of key indicators, such as you know, distribution of goods, um, a range of uh, uh, um, decorated amount, etc. With confidential computing and what we see a data key room um, in the demo, um, carriers can easily upload those relevant data and those, uh, and, and we can also use that to perform um, certain um, computations um, in, in, in the demo. Um, and to last, you know, in the demo, we will also see uh, multiple carrier can leverage the same data key room um, to, to, to enhance those uh, representation of shipping insight. So um, that's a lot from your talking. So uh, if you're interested, there's a there's a there's a a, a blog there. But uh, I'll just quickly share um, um, the, the the video uh, of um, of the case that we just spoke about. So on the confidential computing side, we're working with Decentric, which is a member of uh, the confidential uh, computing consortium. Uh, when we go into this user interface, on the left hand side, we see a uh, uh, um, the, the data key room in particular here, um, um, you know, looking into the shipping insight. Um, after that, we see that um, um, there are, let me, let me pause here a little bit. So we see this two part here, as we mentioned earlier, you know, breaking down into the data part and the computation part. And the data part, you know, we have, um, uh, for example, three carriers um, uploading um, shipping uh, related data uh, um, into the data key room. Um, you can imagine in more of a production system, they are going to, you know, connect it, um, um, you know, uh, via, you know, API and stuff. So after they are being uploaded, uh, you see the, the data is actually being encrypted before we send to the, the, the key room. Um, and um, and you know all the different carriers will actually um, um, perform the similar exercise. So after all the three um, um, carriers are providing those data, um, you know, to, to our system, and also with you know blockchain guaranteeing they're 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 being tamper proof. Um, um, they we we will we will simulate the, the the part which the bank you know can also uh, up, upload and share you know what are the entities that they want to get. Uh, information from. So here, you know, the banks will say, you know, I want to get uh, information related to this particular company's call for Adams, you know, with, you know, certain uh, registration code. And after that is being done, um, we will um, um, go into the computation part, you know, just setting the context in practice um, is being performed by multiple companies. Um, it's not by a single person, but this is like a quick demo so that we can all see um, you know, how, how that looks in actions. So in a here, it performs certain set of computations, you know, starting from the top with certain SQL you know, query to union the data with some you know, Python script, um, you know, getting some insights. 
And at the end, if we perform the computation on the right, you know, we can um, um, generate uh, a report uh, for this particular company where uh, if you open that up, uh, this, uh, you know, while shipping line, they don't disclose sensitive information to each other. Uh, um, we can, you know, draw very uh, meaningful insights around, let's say, a company uh, over a certain period. Uh, what are the, let's say, total number of BLs uh, which they had? Uh, what are some of these, you know, uh, cargo quantity statistic? Um, you know, uh, followed by some of these, you know, declaration amount and followed by the bottom, um, you know, uh, exactly what are some of the goods which um, they have shipped. And, and in my view, and when we engage with banks, you know, these are all variable data um, for banks to, 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 to provide financing to their customer. So um, that's a quick intro on GSBN. Uh, if you're interested in knowing more, um, yeah, we, we put down a, a hyperledger case studies. Um, so a lot more details on some of the use cases. Uh, we will also be um, in, in Long Beach, California, um, joining the TPM23 and TPM Tech Conference um, uh, organized by the um, um, Journal of Commerce. So um, yeah, if you're around, um, yeah, um, yeah, I'd love to meet with you in person. Um, and lastly, um, yeah, thank you. So uh, if there's any fur fur further questions, um, yeah, uh, feel free to, you know, uh, send me an email, connect with LinkedIn. Um, yeah, thank you. So uh, back to you, Julian. Okay, thank you, thank you, Edmund. That was that was excellent, right? Pulled everything together, right? From uh, the hyperledger, uh, blockchain, the confidential computing, and now actually uh, in uh, in uh, in implementation at, at GSBN. So uh, now we have uh, about five to seven minutes uh, of Q and A. So please, people, do put your questions in. Um, now let me see. I got to get uh, pull some of these up. Um, so I think one of the, the kind of questions we're getting is uh, how does one get involved, right? How does one join, uh, 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 get involved in, in Hyperledger, confidential computing, and also GSBN? So maybe we'll start with with uh, with uh, with Dan. Do you want to talk a little bit about how one can get involved, uh, one join, uh, and get involved in, in the great work that the CCC is doing? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's one we get a lot, of course. Um, so you can go out to our website and you'll see all the projects there. One of the ways that I get engaged with open source is I go try to build something out of one of the projects and that kind of gets my hands in. If you're more inclined to get involved through meetings, we meet as the uh, technical council every other Thursday. So we'll be meeting next Thursday, which is the 26th at 7 a.m. Pacific. Uh, and I can uh, put the connection info into uh, one of the uh, chat answers uh, over here on the platform. Okay, excellent. How, do you want to talk a little bit about how you get involved in uh, Hyperledger? Absolutely, yeah. So, um, as you know, as Dan said earlier, the CCC and Hyperledger are laid out in a fairly similar way. Um, so, a lot of the ways that you might want to get involved in CCC are also ways that you might want to get involved in Hyperledger. Um, it's great, you know, looking around the wiki. Uh, to see sort of what projects you might be interested in or, or, or what you want to work on. Um, all of our projects have meetings. So it's, as Dan said, it's, it's often a good idea to just show up at a meeting uh, and start asking questions uh, if you want to get involved. Um, I will note that we also have a, uh, a pretty extensive, uh, num we have a, a large number of special interest groups, which are typically focused on a particular application area. Uh, and if you're interested in, you know, a blockchain for a specific application, uh, then these special interest groups are often a great way to get involved. Hey, uh, maybe let me share the part about GSBN. So, um, yeah. as a not-for-profit consortium, um, currently, um, I think that so it sort of depends on, uh, you know, what sort of organizations that 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 you're representing. So, uh, while we are not-for-profit, you know, we also have, you know, some sort of a membership structure that's similar to, say, you know, Hyperledger. Um, so if you're a shipping line, if you are terminals, if you are, um, uh, you know, a banks, you know, uh, we have some, you know, uh, a membership uh, for you to consider. Uh, but if you are, you know, not, not, you know, not, not those banks, shipping line and terminals, um, as I mentioned earlier, we, we also work with, um, you know, different um, application builder to explore, you know, a, a range of use cases. Um, so if you want to get involved, um, yeah, yeah. Let, let's speak, you know, send me an email. <laughs> um, I think that depends on use case to use case, you know, uh, yeah, we can we can take from there. 
Thank you, Edmund. Edmund has been involved. He started the High Pledger uh, meetup, and he's very much involved in the community as well, right? So uh, very much contributing back. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, also, I think we should mention we have a special interest group for uh, supply chain and trade finance. Um, so I think we have Andrea and Eric who are probably listening to this, right? So please do, do, do check that out uh, as well. So we have some specific questions here, um, which I have. Uh, uh, someone, Ayan, has asked... Uh, uh, I'm not sure this is relevant. Edmund, what do you think of integrating GSBN with SWIFT infrastructure? So, um, so what we see is, um, so we have we have conversation with SWIFT, uh, in short, um, and, and what we see is SWIFT, uh, SWIFT you know, uh, 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 of course, you know, a lot of them uh, is providing, uh, you know, a network, you know, originate from banks and very often related to, you know, payment aspect. But we also see that uh, SWIFT um, has certain initiatives with, um, um, you know, we're related to a particular the, the, the space related to trade. Um, so, um, so you know, um, um, I don't have anything you know that I can announce publicly yet. Um, but, but, but we're, we're definitely aware of you know, um, you know, organization as with, um, yeah. Thank you. And I see Thomas Klein also in the, in the answers. He, he's given the link, and we'll do this when we at the YouTube. We'll give you a link uh, to the to, to the supply chain and trade finance Nick. So here's some specific questions for you here at, uh, from Amitra. Um, there is, in reference to cargo release use case, could we also capture info from those shipping docks and use them for invoice calculation and reconciliation? Um, yeah. So what 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 I I think I, I see two two questions. I also see sort of time of running out. Maybe I want to, you know, take it take it take it both. So I see Please one about um, cargo release. Um, um, second one about um, yeah about about trailings. So maybe I, I share some of some of our view. Um, so particular of a cargo release, you know, what we see is you know we we start with the the process of um. Of, of certain supply chain, you know, so there are certain documents related to the, you know, the release of the cargo, um, um, which is at the container port. But uh, but this that but to share some you know uh, background information, this is uh, I would say where we start digitizing the process on the supply chain because um, cargo release is a process that um, actually involve a lot of the terminal and the shipping line. And then GSBN, you know, we have a strong footprint and and and, and early adoptions because of our founding members <laughs> involving shipping line. Um, and, 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 and terminals. So this is where we start. Uh, it doesn't mean that we end here. Um, and, and, you know, this is the process, you know, we look into the logistics side of things. We start with the cargo release process, you know, we can move on to, you know, warehouses, you know, we attach a folder, et cetera. So, so on that front, what we see is the process of digitizing the trade finance and starting from the, 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 the document or information capture in the cargo release process. And from the end, you know, we are, we are extending. Um, yeah, second question, I saw some questions about, you know, trainings um, and, and what, what we see uh, at GSBN. So first, um, yeah, we want to give a lot of credit to trainings. Um, yeah, I think they have done um, yeah, a lot of, you know, good work. Uh, and, and GSBN, um, what we see, you know, uh, uh, at, at GSBN, um, the, 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 the trainings, the, the platform may longer to may, may not be you know, operating, but we see you know, um, digitization of shipping or global trade is here to stay. So um, at GSBN, you know, um, maybe certain area we take it differently, you know, uh, set it up as a not-for-profit you know, uh, consortium or the business end from a technology, you know, rather than looking and solely focusing on just blockchain technology, we see how blockchain can you know, complement with you know, other, other type of technologies such as you know, confidential computing, you know, uh, you know, other technology we also look into such as verified credentials, you know, decentralized identity, et cetera. Um, and lastly, you know, um, yeah, um, yeah, we have some focus on collaboration. You know, that's why we have the webinar today. Um, you know, we, we, if you're interested, I see that a lot of questions. Thank you. Um, I know that we are running out of time. Um, you know, I would love to, you know, connect with, you know, um, you know, all of you, you know, after this call. Um, and yeah, we, we see collaboration is key. Um, you know, we see a GSBN and, and if, and it to, and, 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 in, in if it's relevant from your organization, you know, also participate in, in Hyperledger and, and Confidential Computing Consortium, you know, uh, event, join as member, et cetera. So, yeah, back to you, Julian. I think, yeah, I think that's it. We're, we're, we're up to the hour, right? So we knew this is always gonna be a, a challenge to get all this great information and we've done it. <laughs> so I would like to thank, uh, thank, thank Dan, uh, Hart and Edmund for your expertise and sharing today. I'd like to thank the audience uh, for being here and listening. Uh, and I think this is just a, 
part of a continuing conversation we're having on, on what we're doing here at Hyperledger and the uh, 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 consortium, the confidential consortium. Uh, so, um, uh, so thank you, everybody. Uh, take care. Uh, we will put more information down on how you get joined, how you get contact at, at the bottom of this video if you're watching this on YouTube later. Um, and uh, really just thank you. Thank you again uh, to, to the speakers today. And thank you, everyone, uh, for, 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 for listening and collaborate. We look forward to it. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.